Welcome back to Shoreditch Radio. My name's Eleanor Conway. This is my social network. And today I have got um, a gentleman in the studio. I'm really excited. I found him on the internet. I started stalking him and then just called him a random <laughs> on a random Saturday night while I was watching X Factor and said, hello, do you want to come and live with me in a little cardboard box in Hackney? And he said, yes, I do. Let's do it. Um, he's got a most incredible uh, life story. Uh, I'll let you, t- I'll let him tell it yourself. So himself. Uh, his name is Sean Atwood. Hello. Thank you for coming in, Sean. How are you doing? Thanks for it. Thanks very much for having me on. That's all right. That's all right. Um, so, if you, it just can you just tell us a little bit about what your story is? Your kind of top line. What is what is the top line of your story? Because it's amazing. Well, I started following the stock market when I was fourteen. I made my first investment when I was sixteen. Doubled my money in British Telecom shares. Went over to America and made a million in the stock market as a young person. The money goes right to my head. I start throwing rave parties with it because I started <laughs> raving in Manchester when it began. And it made such a big impression on me. I didn't see the law as an obstacle to my party, and so I had people bringing tens of thousands of hits of ecstasy over from Amsterdam. A SWAT team smashed my door down, and I end up in this jail that's got the highest rate of death in America. Not only are the gang members murdering the pris- prisoners in this place, even the guards are murdering the prisoners. That's pretty mental. How did you, uh, how did you uh, um, survive, cope, <laughs> with, cope with that daily trauma? Well, I'm not a tough guy. And, you know, you, you go in there and you just go in complete and not a shock. You've got to get used to the sounds of heads getting smashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around, seeing people getting carried on stretchers. But out of the over 100 people who arrested with me from the rave scene were some of my bouncers, including a massive best friend of mine called Wild Man, who's twice my size, his, his fists almost twice the size of mine, covered in scars all over them. So he protected me when I first went in. But I was only around him for the first year. When I got split from my co-defendants, I started writing stories for the prisoners. Um, one of the guys whose story I was writing, whose life story I was writing, was an Irish-Italian mafia mass murderer called Two Tonys. He left dead bodies from Tucson to Alaska, but he claimed they all had it coming because they were rival gangsters. So he didn't see anything wrong with that. Now, if you've murdered gangsters, you're at the top of the hierarchy in, in the prison yard. And I did end up having problems with the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang, but because I was writing his life story, he said, you know, I'm going to make this go away, don't walk the yard alone for the next few days, and, and he did. So these guys who, who I was writing for took me under their wing. And um, this, your story got to, um, you know, uh, the general public's ears through a, a blog that you were writing, weren't you, yeah. whilst you were in prison, and you were giving, giving it to your aunt, and uh, yeah. she was sending it through to your parents who were typing yeah. it up and putting it on online yeah. for every, anyone to see, and it's, it's on there now. What's the, what's the URL? It's John's Jail Journal and John, J-O-N. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so were you not fearful that somebody would read it? Because it's the internet, anyone can see it. Were you not fearful that someone would read it and kind of stalk you down? <laughs> like you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the cops. That sheriff dude is quite nasty. What's his name, Sheriff? Are you working for the cops? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, well, you're alive now. You're out, you're out in the open. You're okay. Is this you're a sting free. operation? <laughs> yes, yeah, the worst sting operation ever. <laughs> In fact, this radio station has just been made for you, for this, for this project. You've forgotten the question, haven't you? Can you repeat the question, Eleanor? I can't even remember the question. And weren't you fearful that, that you were writing this blog, your, pet, mm. your folks were putting it on the internet, obviously the people from the jail could have seen it yeah. and come and stalked you down because you, you, know, right. you had a pseudo name. I started the blog when I was on remand in the maximum security Madison Street Jail in Phoenix, where the, this is where the guards were murdering the prisoners. A guard said to me, the world has got no idea what's really going on in here. So with a tiny little pencil like you see in a betting shop, sharpened on the door, I started to write everything down. I couldn't put these things in the mail. Like you said, I recruited my aunt to take them out for me. Now, we didn't release my name to the media or put my name on the blog. It was just John. So no one knew who I was. I was scared, but I thought it was more important that the world found out about all the human rights violations and all that kind of stuff. It was only after I was moved from that remand jail to the prison system where the prison buildings were named after guards that had been murdered by the prisoners, so it was the other way around there, we felt safe enough for to release my name. But I'm, I'm thinking if someone had read the blog, they would have known the name of the prison. And, you you know, I don't, I can't, I'm pretty sure that you mentioned that you're a, a, an English guy in the blog. So it's not yeah. going to be too hard. I'm guessing there's yeah. not many English guys in that prison. Right. 
I was scared, but I was just relying on changing my name to protect me. Not, <laughs> you hadn't thought it through, had you? <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a few. You write a lot about your, um, the characters um, that you found in, in the jail or that, that were kind of around you at the time. The, who was it? The, the transsexual guy. Not the transsexual guy, but the tall... What's the tall yeah. guy's name? I had um, a friend <laughs> called Zena, six and a half foot, charismatic transsexual. And Zena one day woke up drank a cup of coffee, grabbed the razor blade and started to cut his man parts off, slashed open his scrotum, you know, got one of the testicles off. The other one hides and he's got his hand up in his guts looking for it. He says he could feel his intestine Mm. and he's bleeding to death, literally blood is squirting against the wall and they get a helicopter to the prison and they get him to hospital just in time to save his life. Wow. And so what happens? Like, what happens? Does he only have one ball? He only has one ball. And the reason they do this is because if they cut them both off, the transsexuals, they feel more like women. The skin thins, the voice softens, they don't lose the hair. And they also get estrogen smuggled in. Wow. Wow. I'm just in a little <laughs> bit. I feel a bit like that. That sounds painful. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, rapey stuff that goes on in yeah, prison. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you get christened? The most common question I get asked <laughs> when I do my talks to schools is, did you drop the soap in the shower? You know, I've seen all these movies with the big tattooed men and the communal shower. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to get thrown in there and brutalised, but it wasn't like that. The showers were little cubicles on with the end, end of the room. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the showers were little. <laughs> the showers. <laughs> he's got listeners. He's got lovely cheekbones. Lovely cheekbones. If I was a, a convict, I don't even know where I'm going with this. <laughs> it's a good job I didn't wax my ass before I went in there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Um, so you didn't get raped. Well done. That's good. Thank that, you. That's pretty good. It was an accomplishment. How many people have had, had had that accomplishment? It's like quite a rare accomplishment not to have got bummed. Um, they have a penchant for rape in America for a prison rape. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty good. You came out unscathed. Um, and who else? Oh, what about Frankie? Frankie was a guy that had a bit of a crush on you, wasn't he? Frankie was a Mexican mafia hitman, and he was in for murder for hire. He beat that case because all the witnesses disappeared. <laughs> He was a bit like Joe Pesky character in Goodfellas. One minute he's cracking jokes, next minute everyone's afraid of him. And th- when he came to my cell door to introduce himself, he comes to the plexiglass window. My pants and boxers are down, and I'm applying antifungal <laughs> ointment to the bleeding bed sores on my buttocks. <laughs> he takes one look at this, and he decides to play a practical joke on me. A couple of hours later, I get a love letter shoved under my door, commenting on my hurry arse and proposing we have a gay prison marriage. His exact words were, I'm looking forward to shampooing your hurry arse on our honeymoon in San Francisco. (laughs) Fortunately, he was just joking. He was a chess heavyweight. He served 18 years, and I played chess with him on a regular basis. There was no kinky sex stuff involved and my anal virginity is intact great <laughs> but that's a long time that's a long time six years is a long time to go without a bit of loving yes um you start to use your left hand after so many years and it feels like a whole new experience <laughs> there's also there's also something called the fifi bag frankie it was frankie who told me about the fifi bag which is like a sock lotioned up with warm water or a flannel or a a towel will suffice and I I tried it a couple of times but cleaning it up was just too too difficult so (laughs) I didn't really make a habit of the Fifi bag what do you do like when one sorry I know I'm I'm kind of being a bit grotesque but we all want to know the people in the control room all want to know so what do you do what's the etiquette if one of you wants to have a wank sorry take it um, all sex is prohibited in prison you get a ticket a dis- and disciplinary sanctions even masturbation or wow. consensual sex or anything so you got to take it to the shower and like i said they're cubicles the security cameras can't see in there but because of that it's also the preferred place where the gang members murder the prisoners wow what's the most gruesome way that someone had been has been murdered and what's the reason generally all right well i've got 
a video on YouTube right now that's got over 300,000 hits. Is that the one that I won't look at? It's the one that you, I sent to you that you won't look at. It's one of them. There's, there's several. <laughs> and what it is, it's um, if, if you want to see how real this is, the YouTube channel is Derek at ATT. And it's an Aryan brother, prison gang member, murdering another white prisoner who's refused to beat someone up for the gang. And the method he uses to kill him is he just grabs his head and he smashes it over and over and over into the concrete. Ten minutes in, you know, this is, this is the guard's CCTV screen. He's supposed to be watching this and stopping any trouble as it happens. Ten minutes in, the guard still haven't responded. So he just starts stomping on the back of the guy's oh. head and neck. Twenty minutes in, the guy's well dead by now. So he picks the dead body up. He brings it out right in front of the camera like he's trying to show it off. He tries to shove it off a balcony. It gets stuck on a railing and he starts kicking it over and over and over. Whoa. This is how much control the gangs have got in uh, over the prisoners versus the guards. And what's in, uh, so what was the reason? What's the reasoning? Is it just to kind of show how tough one, one <clears throat> side is? Or? No, the gangs have rules and he refused to beat someone up for them. As soon as you walk in, whatever race you are, the gang is going to come up to you. The, the four major gangs, it's the whites, the blacks, the Mexicans and the Mexican-Americans in Arizona. So because I'm white... As soon as I walked in, Aryan Brotherhood prison gang come up to me. First thing they do is ask you what your charges are, and you can't lie because it's on a little printout from the jail. Some charges are K-O-S by the gang, which means kill on sight, such as sex offences. Other charges are SOS, which means smash on sight. So if you've got a sex offence or a crime against a woman or a child, as soon as you go in, these guys are going to try and murder you. At the very least, they're going to smash you. Once you've got past that interrogation, then you have to go to the meeting and meet what's called the head of the race who explains all the rules you must follow. If someone calls you a punk, a bitch, or hits you, you must fight them on the spot or else the whole gang will smash you. You must take showers or they'll smash you for having bad hygiene. Can't go making friends with the guards or else they'll smash you for snitching. Can't go sitting at the tables with the other races or else they'll smash you for that. They're constantly looking for people to beat up because that's how they rise up in the gang, earn their reputations and earn their tattoos. For acts of violence, they get tattoos, and the more serious the act of violence, the more the higher up in the gang hierarchy is the tattoo. To be a full member of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang, you have to murder someone in the jail for them, and, and you get the warbird tattoo, which means you're, you're fully patched in as a full member. What are the perks of that? <laughs> do, you get, do you get a pension? That sounds horrible. The, the, um, what happens is... The young people come in and they're scared and they click up with the gang and the gang purports to protect them. But over time, the gang uses them up and it's blood in and blood out. And when they try and get out, you know, it's all over for them. It sounds like it sounds like a landscape of like the hardest, hardest blokes <laughs> in your school, like but times a million. Do you know what I mean? It's it's there's no respite, is it? That's a good analogy because it is like a high school mentality in there, but with deadly consequences. It's like an X factor for inmates, is it? Like all the all the kind of tough sort of like ninja like survival skills a little bit because there's no there's no women there to soften it up. There's no, I don't know. It just seems very tough. Yes, they they say that bringing female guards in does uh, soften the atmosphere a bit. So they've, they've that's, that's the trend now. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that works? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Talking about women, uh, there's a love story <coughs> in your um in your blog. Right. You uh, is that right to talk about that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I thought uh, I just it was lovely. It just it kind of suggests a movie to me. <laughs> um, there's a there was a young quite hot criminologist <laughs> criminologist can't even say the word. Um, and she started um coming to see you in jail, didn't she? She did. Yes. And you kind of fell in love. Would yes. I be right in saying that? Yes. And she I, I, from from the from your diary writings, it sounded like she really kept you going and kind yeah. of really, yeah. um. I don't know. Kind of helped you through day to day and just in the long term. What happened? Did you fall in love? Like, what happened? Could it? Could it? Could it? Did it sustain itself on the outside? Okay, she flew to England um, for a couple of weeks, and we really got along great. But she went back to America, and she got really ill. And right now, she has possible surgery. Yeah, no. so she she can't she can't leave the country, and she's also met someone else. So okay, yeah, that's that's how that ended. Oh. Yeah, but we're still in touch. You know, she's going to be in my third book, Prison Time. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're still good friends. That's good, but yeah. I mean, that must have been quite um, intense for someone to go on that journey, on that heightened emotional journey within the prison, and then yeah. kind of see her outside. How did it? How did it? How did it work? How did it? Feel? Well, I'm forever in debt for a you know 
spent coming and braving that environment to come and visit me. And when you go in that environment, when you're in that environment with someone, it's like only that person can truly understand the environment. And because you've got that shared experience, you're bonded for life. It's like when I got released, you know, I was, gr I was glad I was out of prison, but I was missing the prisoners. I almost wanted to go back to be around them because I, I was feeling they're the only ones who could 100% understand what I'd been through. And do you still find that? Do you still feel that, that no one can truly understand what you've been through? Yes. I, you know, I, I, I try and portray it as best as I can, but you have to have actually have been there to fully understand it. Well, it's, it's, such yeah. a weird, it's such a weird situation, isn't it, for a guy from Witness? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Business graduate and yeah. just this nerdy, not tough guy at all. And just like, yeah, it really is. I think that's why people are so interested in my story, because I'm not a tough guy. You know, when I talk to the schools, they see that I was a model student. I went to college and university and all this stuff. And that's why they relate to me. I mean, do you think do you think that the business acumen or your kind of intelligence that you exhibited from kind of making your millions doing the stockbroking stuff? Yeah. Do you think that kind of translated on navigating the through prison, that prison industry or that prison landscape without getting hurt? It, I applied it to the ecstasy business when I was dealing ecstasy. I used all of the business techniques I'd learned, you know, in university and as a stockbroker. And in prison, because I, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not going to be fighting people, am I? So I had to use my people skills and my education and my Englishness. The Americans would be like, you're a goddamn limey cousin from across the pond asking me if I knew the Queen and the Spice Girls and the Beatles and I'd be playing along with it. So everything at my disposal, it was like I was in a video game surrounded by ever-present ever danger. And what, I've got to get through it no matter what. So I'm just using everything at my disposal to to survive and, and not get smashed. Um, I guess that must that must have taken a lot of mental energy. Yeah, it did. Did you, it, it did you did. when you came back to the UK? I mean, sort of. How did how did that kind of extinguish itself? That energy. How did it release? It takes a lot of mental energy, and your adrenaline is going nonstop. When you first get arrested, you're in complete and utter shock, and you can't sleep for days. You know, you're lying on the mattress all night. Tossing and turning the pool of sweat because it's so hot out there. And you can, you can hear your heart just going mm -hmm. against the mattress all night long. And when I got out, you know, I'd done almost six years. So I was institutionalized from all these thought processes of just dealing with this stuff day to day. And my mum said I was like a puppy dog um, following around the house waiting for orders. So it took me, like, you know, I lived with my parents. I was on the dole for the first year back in England. And it took me over a year before I felt comfortable enough in my own head to move down south and, and get some work going. Wow. That's pretty <laughs> mental. <laughs> You've actually rendered me speechless, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, <laughs> so the survival techniques how like that you learned in prison, how yeah. how how are they manifesting themselves now? I mean, I'm, I, I read that you don't do drugs mm. anymore, so that, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's not an option. Are you, what, where does all... All right. I, I met a brilliant psychotherapist in prison, and he said to me, Sean... You've, um, you've got this addictive, you know, adrenaline junkie, risk-taking personality type. That's why you're attracted to the ups and downs of the stock market and all that kind of behavior. And he said the key to deal with that is to view it as just energy. I was choosing to take my energy and put it into these negative addictions, driving around in my sports car, 120 miles an hour, high on crystal meth, you know, hanging out with all these gangsters in the drug community, all this stuff that could have got me killed. I still hear the wolves howling for me to come out and party, especially when I hear like an old school rave song. Even even in introducing this uh, show, I heard the, the beat. The beat was going in there. I could feel it. I could feel the tingling on on the back of my neck. You know, coming down like this way. But I've learned now that those wolves will always be in there, and it, and it's just energy. And I'll, I'll remember what this psychotherapist said, and I'll I'll go to the sports center now do karate, come out on natural high, or jump around with 60 women at one of these body combat classes, the thumping dance music. <laughs> come out on natural sure high. that's the only reason? <laughs> hey, I'm on the front row, so it's not me checking their asses out. <laughs> You're giving them some eye candy. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, you know, you, it, and I've, I, like I mentioned earlier to you, I went and saw Carl Cox in London. I did go to a, a rave. And um, I'm, I did a Red Bull and a vodka, and I was dancing all night. People are offering me drugs all night long, and I'm refusing. And they're asking me, and they're asking me, and they're asking me. And, and you know, eventually I start telling some people why. <laughs> and they're just like, ah. Buzzkiller. 
I went to this rave and this guy wouldn't shut up. <laughs> and he wasn't even on drugs. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So look, the book, the book, you've got Hard Time Out at the moment. You've got, this is going to be a trilogy, isn't it, these books? Yes. Party Time is coming out in April of next year. And that's everything that is led to... Is that going to be the juicy drug one? <laughs> it is, yeah. It's everything that led to a SWAT team smashing my door down. <laughs> yes. Great stuff. And, uh, I th- you know, it just seems like it's a movie. It just seems like a movie. You couldn't make this shit up. Right. Is it going to be a movie? We've had interest, and what they're saying is they can't make a movie off Hard Time because it's just the 26 months in the jail. It's a bit depressing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they want the back, the full backstory, so they've been waiting for Party Time to come out before they make that decision. So it's going to be the good, good bit, the bad bit, and then the kind of coming out and everything's all good bit. And my redemption, yes. Yeah, that's good. Who's, who's going to play you, do you reckon? Who would you like to play you? I have no idea. As long as it's not some tough, Rambo-looking, gangster-looking person, and they keep the story true to what it is, I don't, I don't care. If, if it gets to that level. It's a fantasy question. What fantasy? <laughs> <laughs> you can have any actor, alive or dead. Which I don't watch television and I just, I really, I'm not familiar with a lot of people so I just can't even answer that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> that's good. Go and buy the book. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, I've got me copy that I'm going to sit down with and pour through later on tonight. Yes, you'll be having nightmares. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sleep tight, people. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for being my guest today, Sean. It was really was an amazing pleasure. The, the, the feeling is mutual. That was Thank what you. you were supposed to say. <laughs> I'm going to be going home with a big smile on my face. Yay! <laughs> That's what we like to hear. This is Eleanor Conway on Conway Social Network for Shoreditch Radio. Ta da! Oh,